dogmatic constitution de verbo of the Second Vatican Council. Essentially, tonight we want to look at one question, ultimately and principally. How does the church know what she says that she knows? This is the question we'll come to again and again, we'll return to the rock of the evening. But I'd like to start tonight by reading to you the preface of the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. Where it says, Hearing the word of God with reverence and proclaiming it with faith, the sacred synod takes its definition from these words of St. John. Quote, We announce to you the eternal life which dwelt with the Father and was made visible to us. What we have seen and heard, we announce to you, so that you may have fellowship with us, and our common fellowship be with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. It's from 1 John, chapter 1. Therefore, following in the footsteps of the Council of Trent, and of the First Vatican Council, this present Council wishes to set forth authentic doctrine on divine revelation and how it is handed on so that by hearing the message of salvation the whole world may believe by believing it may hope and by hoping it may love to start tonight we'd like to make two distinctions in thinking about the concept of revelation when scholastics classically distinguished between what was called the fides quae and the fides qua, which is to say the whatness of faith and the thatness of faith, or another way of saying that, that I believe and what I believe. So the act of belief and the content of the faith. Revelation is going to encompass both those things. To start tonight, I'd like to go through a series of definitions. A series of definitions on very common terms that we use. Words that can stand a little precision and are important, I think, when we're going through the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation. So we'll talk about these words. Theology. Revelation. Faith. Tradition. And lastly, a word dear to the heart of Dominicans, sacra doctrina, or holy teaching. Okay? So we'll move slowly through these and we'll come back to them towards the end of the lecture and get a more precise notion of what the document is trying to tell us about these very basic things that help us to think about God. So first of all, theology. Theology is ordered faith discourse about God, or as a professor liked to say, God talk, simply said, and about all things in relation to God. My father often asked, well, you know, you're going to spend six years studying theology, what will you do when you spend the six years studying theology? Uh, it's something that escapes some of us in terms of its abstract notion. Theology proceeds from Revelation and talks about revelation. So we see here, obviously, theology and revelation are not the same thing. That's the first thing that's important to notice. But theology presupposes faith. Faith presupposes revelation. Now, if you pay attention, we'll get kind of past the word game of some of these definitions, but by clearing the terms of the debate. Now for a definition of the, the word revelation. Revelation can be seen in two parts. Revelation is an act of God that reaches through His activity in history and His interior activity in the believer. Okay, so think back to what I was just talking about, the fides quae and the fides qua. The content of belief and the action of belief. These are very commonplace things that we think about. How does that student of mine, how does that son or daughter of mine, 
How do I simply show them the faith? How do I get them to come to believe? These are two different questions. It's a distinction that's made when we talk about revelation. Now for a de definition of the concept of faith. Augustine makes a triple distinction when talking about faith. He says, faith is to believe in God. But he also says it's to believe God. Okay, so what God is telling me. He then says it's believing into God, meaning we enter into the life of faith. We enter into the divine life. St. Thomas Aquinas says, faith is the habit of the mind whereby eternal life is begun in us, making the intellect assent to what is not apparent. Okay, so the parts of that definition. Faith is a habit of the mind. The intellect acts in the act of faith. Okay. Eternal life is begun in me when I have faith. Faith is given to me. Okay? So eternal life is truly and really begun in my heart and in my mind by the gift of faith. Whereby my intellect assents to what is not apparent. Okay? So faith by definition is having belief in something that is not perceptible to my senses. made mention of the RCIA on Sunday that St. Thomas Aquinas famously said regarding the Feast of Corpus Christi, he talked about the Eucharist, that when approaching the Eucharist, all my senses tell me that it's bread, essentially. Right? It looks like bread, tastes like bread, feels like bread, smells like bread. Well, then in terms of an aspect of knowledge, how do we know that it's the body and the blood of Christ? faith acting in us. It's an important thing to remember, I think, in as much as we know that faith is not something magical. It's not something that, you know, that we have when we jump off a cliff. I have faith that God will catch me. It's not ignorant in that way. St. Thomas Aquinas notes that faith is a mode of knowledge. It's, it's a true form of knowing. But in a culture that we live in, we're offering fighting from the very beginning of a materialist understanding of knowledge. So when you walk out of this room, when you talk to your friends at work, when you talk to your family, it's oftentimes the presupposition that all knowledge is material knowledge, the scientific method. These are the ways that we've been brought up and taught in school. Hopefully this discussion tonight will give you an apologetic, a way of talking about the faith intelligently to people in terms of how God reveals himself to us. So faith is therefore a grace. It's infused in us. It's given to us by God. We cannot create it ourselves. It's not something natural. It's supernatural by definition. Only God can give it, therefore. Okay, so when you wonder, why do I have faith and my neighbor doesn't have faith? Only God has the answer to that. It's a grace. God freely gives it. Okay? And the most important thing about faith is a communication of the divine life. A real communication of the life of God. We enter into heaven in a way when we have faith. Tradition. I'll say something about tradition. Because the document's going to talk in length about the interaction between scripture and tradition. And this is the edge of the difference between Catholics and Protestants that's been present since the Protestant Reformation in the time of Luther. So tradition refers to both the form in which things are handed down to us, little t tradition, and the content of what is handed down to us. So tradition is not simply the fact that, well, we've done this for 15 years this way, this is our household tradition. It's not that. And that's a quick and word clarification at the start. That God really operates through the mode of tradition. That God does not simply communicate facts to us, but he communicates his very being. He does this in tradition, sacred tradition. He also does it in sacred scripture. 
And we're going to talk in just a second about how those interact. Okay, so whirlwind of definitions, I've just given you a little bit. We're going to come back to those. But it clears the debate because we can easily step into any discussion of divine revelation with commonplace terms that seemingly every person has a definition of his or her mind of, but not so clear, I think, when we come down to the facts of it, of what these will be. So try to grasp those as best you can. Again, we'll come back to them towards the end to get a more precise understanding through the wisdom of the document. And I'd like to tell you from the start the three principal points that Dave Verbum makes that I will expound in the next hour. And they're really three when it comes down to it. Quite, I think, pointed and quite uh, you know, simple in a certain sense. The first point that Dave Verbum makes, and these are clarified in a document or a, a piece of history that Joseph Ratzinger wrote way before he was elected pope, way before he was made cardinal uh, from his involvement, as Brother Michael was telling us, in the Second Vatican Council. He was someone that spoke authoritatively from the very beginning about the question of revelation in the life of the church. And the composition of this document, and what was the discussion going on amongst the council fathers. And he says this, the first point is this, that the personal context within which the giving and receiving of revelation is appreciated, okay, so that Dei Verbum is interested in that personal context in which revelation is received by the sacred authors in the life of the church. Okay. Secondly, the document Dei Verbum reaffirms the use of the historical critical method. Now how many of you have ever heard of the historical critical method before? So a couple, we'll explain in the talk what it is. It's an important thing to understand in terms of what Dave Verbum promotes in terms of the methodology of looking at and reading scripture scientifically. Okay. It reaffirms it. There's a context historical that. Number three, I've already alluded to this, it reaffirms the connection between sacred tradition and sacred scripture. Now most of us know that Luther famously said that it was sola scriptura by which God spoke. There was no such thing as sacred tradition for Luther, for Protestants from the very beginning. The Catholic Church has held tight to understanding the sacred tradition. I'm going to say a little bit tonight more in detail about what that is and how it interacts with sacred scripture. That the two of those together are indivisible, that they have to operate together, they each one another. And that God acts in revelation through deeds and words. So when someone tries to say to you, well, it's all said in the Bible, well, that is true, okay? But the Bible assumes also the deeds of Christ. Now, as Catholics, we have a certain instinct about this. The sacraments, as we would say, are instituted by Christ. We can read those words in the scriptures, and we can see where Christ instituted them. But it also was a deed he performed that left an external reality, namely the Eucharist, baptism, etc. Right. Okay, so these are some obvious points. Okay. And I'm going to come back to the end and talk about soccer ball training for fear of overwhelming you at the beginning. Um, and talk to you just a little bit about how St. Thomas uses that sense of holy teaching, as maybe one way we can translate it into English, as an all encompassing term to figure out what revelation is. I think many of us instinctually think. Okay, I'm going tonight to listen to a discussion on Dei Verbo, the Second Vatican Council, where the Passion is going to talk to us about sacred scripture. True, but incomplete, because it's something more than scripture that we're going to talk about tonight. And that's the fullness of the Catholic Church and the teaching of the Church. Okay, so a little bit about the setting and the interpretation of scripture and inspiration. I'll give you three commonplace examples of something you might have heard in your own family, you may have said it yourself. Uh, these three examples. The sacred scripture is about the social setting, meaning during the time of Jesus they used bread and wine for the institution of the Eucharist because that was a social convention. It was commonplace for a Palestinian Jew to know of bread and wine as a staple of life and of food. And so today, therefore, our staples might be something like a Mars bar and Coca-Cola. And so therefore, 
that's a proper interpretation of scripture because scripture comes out of a social setting and therefore we need to interpret it into our own social milieu. Okay? You all laughed appropriately, that's ridiculous, but I have good word that people actually said this and actually tried this in the 1960s and the 1970s. Something you might have also heard that Christ chose men as apostles or as disciples because that was a social convention at the time. If, if he was born and lived today, if he would have easily chosen women as well because we are more egalitarian in that regard. This also comes out of a social setting or reading into scripture from a social perspective. Okay, this is also an error of reading scripture. Second example is the extreme on the other side of a certain literalist interpretation. There's a lot of press in the last couple of years specifically about the debate between evolution and creationism. Okay? So what should we say to our kids in school? Should we teach about evolution? Should we teach about creationism? Did God actually create the world in seven 24-hour periods? Okay? That is a faulty understanding of reading scripture. And we'll get into in this lecture a little bit about what are the proper ways to look at scripture that would prevent us from coming to this false conclusion. Okay? For St. Thomas Aquinas and for many others, the literal sense of scripture is the foundational sense. But if literal in your mind means that God created the world in 12, 20, I mean in 7, 24 hour periods, and therefore we need to teach kids in science class a form of creationism, that's not a properly Catholic understanding of a reading of Genesis, in this case, to use that example. Okay, we're not going to talk tonight about creationism and evolution, but that's an example of reading scripture in a faulty sense. The third example is this, also involves the question of kind of some modern question. And it's an Anglican interpretation made by the Archbishop of Canterbury. Just think about four years ago, he published this. He says, well, what we're going to say is what is in the Bible is actually true. It's all factually true. And we're going to give it its context. <clears throat> For instance, the Bible, we will say, we will agree with you, that the Bible speaks conclusively against homosexuality. So the Bible says that homosexuality is a, is a disorder. But what we have today in the year 2011 is a different kind of relationship. It's kind of mankind has evolved, and therefore the relationship we have now between man and man, or woman and woman, in terms of marriage, okay, uh, is a new kind of relationship that Jesus and everyone else in the time of the Bible did not understand. So yes, the Bible speaks against homosexuality, but what we have today is something different. Mankind has evolved further than the perspective of Scripture. Bad. This is very bad. It's a very bad interpretation. It's a bad understanding of the way tradition and the movement of history and time works. Okay? So if you hear people say this, or if you come to this kind of conclusion yourself, these are some bumper pads to have in the back of your mind as to the limits of an understanding of Scripture that are rooted in some false perspectives. The verbum understands this context and is speaking within this context. It's interesting to note that the sense of the church having to make a declaration of divine revelation is a recent phenomenon. Okay, what do I mean by recent? It's a modern phenomenon. You do not see, before the year 1546, any declaration from the church whatsoever about the reality of revelation. All you see in the beginning is the church explaining the Trinity, the Incarnation, the sacraments, or even the authority of the Roman Pontiff, the Pope. So doctrinal, dogmatic matters about the life of God, or even about the church. I'm curious, why do we have to make clear, in a more modern setting, the importance of Revelation? This is the context here. Modern notions of cognition, history, and language. I'm going to talk a lot about this at the last talk in the series of the reception and implementation of the Council. 
But the setting is very important to see. Why is the church saying what she's saying in David Irvin? And why is she stating, in some sense, the obvious? The big secret about this discussion is, in reality, the Second Vatican Council and David Irvin, the church doesn't really say much new. Okay? So don't be shocked in that regard. Now, this is what I mean when I say modern notions of cognition, meaning the way we think about things, history and language. I already mentioned at the, at the start modern notions of materialism. It's interesting. I think we have this concept from the time we're young that what is real is what I can touch, what I can examine by the scientific method. Okay? So angels, are angels real? If someone asked you that, what would you answer? Yes, they are real. Well, how can you prove that? How can you have scientific knowledge of that? Well, St. Thomas would say you can have scientific knowledge of it, but not science understood in the way that you would understand the modern period. Okay? You can have true knowledge of it, in some sense, more true knowledge of an angel than you could of his podium or his desk. Shocking to modern ears. Okay? So this isn't all simply, uh, you know, uh, magic. There's a logic to it, and that's what I'm trying to explain here. A modern notion of cognition is what uh, Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict XVI, has talked about on a number of occasions, relativism. Okay, I have my truth, you have your truth, let's discuss our truths, maybe, and, you know, these kind of things. Well, this is modern. Someone who lived in the ninth century wouldn't have the foggiest notion of what relativism was. It just didn't ever enter their mind. Language, modern notions of language, Deconstructivism. If you go to most universities today and you want to study literature, you're going to study deconstructivism. Reading the Gospel of John tells me a lot about this man named John, or in reality, what some scholars would say, it reveals not the man named John, but the community that was expressing these beliefs written together in the form that we have today. So that's a little bit strange. It should be the path of years that the word merely reveals something about the writer and not about the reality with which it expresses. Okay? If you don't believe that the scriptures are the word of God, we can pack up and go home. We can end the conversation now. So the question is, do we believe that the, that the state of the scripture, that the Bible, is the word of God? How do we believe that and in what manner? That's the question for Dave Verbum. It's the question for we can't discuss the truth, then we can't have theology. And those of us who spend years studying theology are, you know, <laughs> are shamed on both the church and on our lives. Okay. Now I'm going to step through the principal points of what Dave Verbum introduces and say a little bit more in detail about that. So the first point, to reiterate what I said at the beginning, that Dave Verbum introduces this. And this is a little bit of a change in terms of the direction of, of looking at the Bible in the year 1965 when it comes out. Now, in discussing the text, it has six principal chapters. You'll see them here on the board. They're pretty straightforward. It's a relatively short document compared to the others. First point that David Verbum wants to introduce to the world, to the church. A more personal context within which the giving and the receiving of revelation is appreciated. So they want you, the church wants you, to take the Bible more seriously on a personal level. And it wants you to understand the way it was written more personally. Not just as, this is what John says, this is what Mark says, but who was this man named St. John? who was in love with God, who knew God, and who acted as an instrument to the reality that is God and broke down. Okay. He wants to introduce those concepts to you a little bit more deeply. This involves what was called, or Joseph Ratzinger points out, the biblical movement, which was taking place in the early 20th century, which coincided in a certain sense with the liturgical movement. And Brother Michaels mentioned a couple of these points, 
and talking about Sacro Sacro Concilium on the liturgy. Okay, for a Catholic, it is instinctual to see that the Bible and the liturgy go hand in hand. You'll hear this often said, well, you know, before a certain period of time, Catholics never read the Bible. Okay, so Catholics of the Middle Ages, those poor folks, they never read the Bible. The assumption, therefore, being those poor folks in the Middle Ages never knew the Bible. Well, I would dare bet they knew the Bible better than any or most of us today. Why and how? They knew the Bible through the liturgy, through memorization, through repetition. They were immersed in these things. St. Thomas Aquinas, who knew the Bible through the liturgy in a principal fashion, so not only meaning the Mass, so the readings of Mass, but also the Divine Office, which a religious priests celebrate constantly, full of Scripture, full of the Psalms, full of readings from the Old Testament, full of readings from the New Testament. Okay. So to be immersed in the liturgy is to be immersed in Scripture. It's interesting to note, this is a nice piece of trivia for you for Jeopardy, or for a cocktail party conversation, that the Catholic Church in three years, if you go to Mass every day, or even every Sunday for three years, you will hear nearly the entire Bible in that period of time. Ask your Protestant friends if they do that in church. Okay, I'm born and raised Protestant, Protestant, converted in college. I can tell you that Protestants do not read that much scripture. They don't. They go into the context of their worship services. I think it's true to say they're more diligent to read the Bible personally at home, but in the context of the Mass, the liturgy, the hours, the no one outdoes the Roman Catholic Church in reading the Bible in that context. Okay, that's the first point. We'll say a little more about the detail in just a minute. The second and the third point kind of go together. They are these. And Dave Irvin wants you to become more aware of a more sophisticated understanding of biblical authorship achieved in modern historical study. Okay. Now this is an affirmation of what's called a historical critical method, which I'm going to explain to you what it is in one second. But what it says when it says biblical authorship is this, principally. And this is the take of point. That the biblical author acts through what's called instrumental causality in writing the Word of God. He is an instrument of God. If someone asks you who is the author of sacred scripture, what do you answer? Not John the Evangelist, not Moses, not St. Paul. The principal author of sacred scripture is God himself. That's amazing. Okay? There's nothing in the world we can say that about other than the, the Word of God itself. Okay? That the author acts as an instrument, truly. St. Thomas Aquinas goes through extensive explanation of what does it mean to act as an instrument. Okay? Simply put, in one example he gives is wood, I mean, saw, a saw cutting wood. Okay? That the, the wood is cut by the saw through the means and the agency of the man who wields the saw. So the saw cannot, by its nature, jump up from the table and cut wood itself. It needs to be wheeled, it needs to be used properly, it needs to be, needs to be treated rightly, and therefore it does its job. It performs the end that's written into its nature. So any of us can think of teaching our little brothers or our sons how to cut wood with a saw. If he doesn't know how to use it, it's awkward. He either doesn't know how to use it at all, or he does it badly. That speaks to you about the nature of an instrument. Okay, so all of us, pray God, wants to be instruments of God. We want to become holy. And therefore we pray each day to become better and more perfect instruments. That's the work of, of, of sanctification. Okay? And this is what the biblical authors did. The other thing that's important here is the unity of the Old Testament and the New Testament. There are many Christians who will just give you the New Testament, saying the Old Testament is old, as in outdated, no longer useful, etc., passé. Uh, the Catholic Church has never said that, and continues to reaffirm the unity of the Old Testament and the New. To understand Jesus, we need to understand the prophets and where he came from. 
Timothy, that there is the Word of God that is complete by reading Genesis, by reading the Gospel of John, by reading Revelation. I had a scripture professor who used to get furious if you ever saw a Bible on your desk with the red letter edition. Many of you are converts or seen these red letter, these are famous in Protestant circles. You buy a Bible where you know the words of Jesus that he spoke are in red, highlighted, so you can find them quickly. Okay, the assumption there is a faulty one, obviously, in the sense that it assumes that the red portions are the word of God and everything else is something else. Okay. In truth, everything in the Bible, this is the scandalous point of this lecture, you know, what the church says, is the Word of God. Okay. What, what came out of Jesus' mouth when he was on earth, and what Moses transcribed when he wrote the Pentateuch. Okay. The fourth point that Dave Berman wants to introduce or wants to, uh, to highlight for those of us in the church. He wants to highlight the role of study, contemplation, and theology in contributing to the progress of apostolic tradition. Now, this is a point that makes the Dominican very happy. Okay? And that in the labor we've, we've done in this lecture already in talking about what is theology, what is faith, makes this point very important. Okay, what are these things? And how do they contribute to tradition? It's a commonplace question for people to ask. Maybe a question that involves your own vocation or your life. People will say, how do I know? Meaning, how do I know the truth? Or how do I know what's real? Or how do I know what God is saying? This is the discipline in appropriating the Word of God in our life. But Christ tells us that we can come to that knowledge. And there's no magic recipe. This is the discipline of true sacred study, and it's a discipline of contemplation as an actual science, as an activity. Okay? Now we'll say a little bit more as we go along about what those things are. What the council rejected was a notion that some wanted to propose that sacred tradition, and sacred scripture, part and parcel contain the truth. So in a certain sense, maybe part was in tradition and part was in scripture. The council rejected that, as it had at the Council of Trent. This was on the table in the 1500s at the Council of Trent. That some Catholics wanted to say, well, it's actually part to part. And that's why you get to the whole. Well, the church constantly says, no, it's whole and whole. And the same when we speak about the divine and the human nature of Christ. Well, Jesus was 100% human being. Okay, that's 100%. Jesus was also 100% divine. Okay, that's 200%. How do we get... So this is a scale. It's whole and whole. Not part and part. This is another topic of discussion for your Protestant friends. The Council talks about the logical priority of tradition. And this is what I mean by that. Often we want to think, I open my Bible, the Scripture, the Word of God jumps off the page onto my, into my mind, and I interpret it. Okay. Well, in truth, the Bible came out of the church. Now, if you think about this, this makes utter and complete sense. We can explain this to a fourth grader. That out of Jesus, let's talk just about the Gospels, for instance, revealing himself to the apostles, to the church, okay, that he was creating in his, in his life on earth, he revealed himself to them in word and deed. And this was then written down. <clears throat> so Jesus saying and performing actions, this is in the context of tradition. God revealing himself to us. God did not say, as some Muslims want to say, that he kind of spoke out of heaven. John, write this now, etc. Okay, he revealed himself in the context of the family, in the context of the church. That's obvious. It makes sense to us. Okay? So deeds and words. And that's basically all Dave Verbal wants to say in terms of the principal point. So if you get the structure of the argument of Dave Verbal, what's going on in these six chapters, there are those principal, four principal points that I've just given you. A more personal context to understand our relation 
the rarest or more sophisticated understanding of biblical authorship, promoting the historical critical method, and the role of study, contemplation, and tradition in the progress of apostolic tradition. Those four points. Okay. What is historical criticism? Now let me give you a little bit of the history of this point. This was first spoken of favorably by the church by a papal encyclical of Pope Pius XII, called the Vini Fonte Spiritu, in 1943. Okay, so the big verbum in 1965 is just picking up this affirmation that was popular at the time in terms of biblical studies. <clears throat> historical criticism is this. It's both historical and critical. Okay? What does that mean? Critical in the sense that it deals with the world behind the word. Okay? So critical in the sense that it's going to look at the text. I'll give you three examples of types of criticism, biblical criticism or literary criticism. This, this kind of method we don't need to use just for the Bible. It's you can you look at it to look at the Brothers Karamazov by Dostoevsky. We look at it Mark Twain with a historical critical sense. But we're going to use this as a tool to look at the Bible. So first of all, it deals with the world behind the word. Textual criticism. This is one example of a critical method. And it's this. It's attempting to ascertain the original wording of the text. So it's getting manuscripts, the earliest ones that we can find, uh, whether they're the Quran, scrolls, etc., and looking at the text, making a critical analysis of the original text. Now part of this is some prejudice that, well, you know, everyone's kind of heard this adage, well, you know, the Bible's written down by monks, and if you're writing for a long period of times, you know, monks are going to skip words, and they might edit the text a little bit, given their own proclivities, and these kind of things. So I bet you that the Bible that was there in the 3rd century AD is very different than the Bible of the 16th century AD. Because these monks, you know, passed hand in hand, and therefore they left a little editing mark, or just human error factored in. Well, surprise, surprise, uh, by finding manuscripts in Quran and other places, finding early, early text in terms of the New Testament, first century text, in terms of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, etc., they found that the words that you and I read in our Bible are pretty, pretty darn close to the original words that were there in the first century or the Septuagint, etc. Question: What is Quran? Quran. So this is an example of an early text of the, the Old Testament that was found by a Bedouin in a cave in the uh, Middle East. This was found in the 20th century. It, it, some shepherd boy was kind of wandering through the desert, born through a rock in a cave, heard an unusual noise, which was ultimately him shattering a clay pot or a series of clay pots. He walked in, found a, a series of old scrolls, thought, well, this is interesting, shared it with the elders of the village or whoever. People thought, well, this is actually really important stuff. We should get scientists and others to look at this. And it was an early copy of the Old Testament, way earlier than any of the other manuscripts that we had. So textual criticism wants to look at the earliest text and compare it. Okay. Next example of a critical method is source criticism. And this is an analysis and a study of the sources used by biblical authors, assuming that they're drawing on different like traditions, oral traditions that were written down, source theories. They may have had kind of common booklets, or so to speak, that were used. Assuming also that there was an oral tradition. Another example, the last one I'll give you, is form criticism. This is an important point. This is something I think is very useful for you to take home with you. When discussing with people, for example, the difference between creationism and evolution. Okay? Well, the Bible says in Genesis that God created the world in seven days. Well, the intelligent person who's looking at scripture using the historical critical method will say, well, what form, what literary form was 
example, the book of Genesis written? Was it parable? Was it poetry? Was it a letter form? Etc. Okay? So if I'm going to take the Bible literally, I need to know the context or the form in which it was written. I'm not going to take a poem literally the same way that I'm going to take a letter literally. Okay, this should make an also instinctive sense to us. Dave Verbum is pointing out this obvious fact. Okay? You need to, so when someone tells you, but, but Genesis says this right here, and it says literally God created the world in seven days. Well, your response to that person is, well, what is the literary form of the book of Genesis in this case? Okay, that's an important question to ask. I think any reasonable person in discussion would accept that question in a debate. What is the literary form? Okay. In some cases, the form is myth. Okay. Oh, it's myth, then, therefore it's not true, it's a fable. No, myth is a literary form as well. And there is such a thing as true myth. Okay? So when you read your child a bedtime tale, whatever it might be, it's written in a mythical or fairy tale form. It is true in some cases. Okay? But it's not true in the same sense that 2 plus 2 equals 4. That's a different form. Okay? That's an obvious point. I want to step through the document a little bit more in detail, the four points that I just made, and talk to you about how David, how the church is understanding in its present time scripture and revelation. So the concepts of inspiration and interpretation, these are complicated and complex points in substance. In substance, not. I hope that this says it's pretty straightforward. So, first of all, the church is going to read the Bible, and it continues to read the Bible, and has read the Bible, in a Christocentric manner. Okay? That salvation history is seen in the context of Christ, which is the fullness of its revelation. And you can, you can therefore, therefore go back and look at the book of Exodus and understand it more completely by understanding who Christ was. By meditating upon it as well. So it's not just simply its literal face value, scientifically, plain spoken, but it's the reflections the church has had by meditating on the words of God for these centuries. That's an important point to remember. Okay, it's why we should read the Bible and meditate upon it, because God speaks to us continually through the Word of God. I'll read to you a quote from St. Thomas Aquinas. It's something very useful, very clear spoken. This is a quote from his Summa Contra Gentiles. He says, After the level of those who receive revelation directly from God, as we talk about the biblical authors themselves, another level of grace is necessary because men receive revelation from God not only for their own time, Okay, so St. John, when he was writing to the church of Ephesus or whoever else, was not just writing to the people in his own period of time, he was writing to you and I today, really. Okay, so that's a special grace given to the sacred author. But also for the instruction of all who come after them, it was necessary that these things revealed to them be passed on not only in speech to their contemporaries, but also is written down for the instruction of those to come after them. And thus it is also necessary that there be those who can interpret what was written down. This also must be done by divine grace. Okay, so to read scripture faithfully, we need to be able to interpret scripture can only do this by grace or by faith. And so we read in Genesis chapter 40, verse 8, he cites, does not interpretation come from God? The grace of interpretation is conferred on the subject of revelation, namely the church itself. 
And that is why those who are charged with the task of interpretation must share in the church's life, especially its liturgical life. Now, this last point is a point of commentary, something we've already said. Okay. You, the scripture is read in the life of the church, principally in the liturgy, but faithfully amongst its members throughout its history. That's the magisterium, that's the path of sacred tradition. So the saints, popes, and others have read the church and read the scriptures faithfully and interpreted it throughout the ages. Dave Verma wants to say, against some modern notions, that the economy of salvation cannot be reduced to a historical process. Okay? Sort of like the point about Anglicanism that I was getting to before, that's just an evolution of ideas, and we're kind of at a new plateau today. The Spirit continues to reveal itself to us, and that was then, and this is now. The Church rejects that notion that there's any historical process in that sense. The Scripture is the whole of Scripture as Christ as its fountain, and that the purpose and the meaning of the Old Testament lie in its prophetic character. Okay? So by reading the book of Isaiah, I can learn more about Jesus Christ. Surprising. Okay, so no coincidence that during Easter season and during Lent as well, we read a lot from the book of Isaiah. Particularly Lent, in this case, of the prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. So the question of church, so last week's lecture on Lumen Gentium, is a very important one in defining who reads scripture. What is the church? Who is the church? Who is the church today? Who is the church throughout the ages? This is a very important question. Okay? It's, it's important to note, it's an interesting thing to keep in mind at this point, that uh, when Jesus Christ is tempted, sent into the desert, the devil does what? Tempting him, quotes scripture. As they say, there's no better theologian than the devil. The devil knows scripture just as well as anyone else, okay? So it highlights the importance of interpreting within the lens of faith, okay? Scripture has been used for every cause, good and evil, so no surprise there. There's a commentary I'd like to give here to on what is the apostolic church that is seen as a historically and unchangeable reality that is enshrined in the 27 books of the New Testament as a divinely created literary depository of revealed truth but extends throughout the ministry of the church which continues dispensing the salvific treasures of the church's teaching his sacrificial death and the everlasting risen life. In this Vision, Revelation is conceived as a broad, multi-dimensional reality, and Scripture constitutes only one component of this reality. The Council itself and Dave Verbum gave this hermeneutic for understanding, or this lens for its study, the question of inspiration. He rejected the notion that was proposed by some might be scandalized to find out who proposed to these in some cases, that, well, actually God revealed himself only, you know, in certain ways in Scripture. Another way to say this, that the parts of Scripture which have a religious relevance, specifically religious relevance, are true in the Word of God, but everything else is kind of just filler. The Council rejected that and gave this statement. I'm going to give it to you here in its Latin form. The words are very important. It says, Veritatem qual Deus nostre salutis causa literis consignare voluit. So those of us who don't speak Latin, I'll give the translation. It's saying, meaning truth, that is for the sake of our salvation, God wanted to be put 
in writing. Now let me repeat that. It's the truth that for the sake of our salvation, God wanted to be put in writing. In saying that, the church reaffirms the fact, the truth here is referring to is, is a commentary that makes explicit uh, point to this detail of the inerrancy of Scripture. That the whole of Scripture is inerrant without error. Not just simply the points that have religious relevance. I'd like to give you something um, in the context of this discussion that you may have never heard before, um, but it's something beautiful in the context of the theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. Many of us, I think, when we're pondering Scripture, wonder, well, in what sense is the Word of God God? Okay. How is it that the Church understands truly the Word actually got.